So uh, these images are you guys. And these are from last night in the project that we did, which is called Colorbox. And we're going to talk a little bit about that and talk a little bit about how it happened and why we're doing it and the role Hatch plays in it. And so I want to start with this. I think we can, you know, there's a pretty cliche answer here, but what's a picture worth? That's right, a thousand words. What else is a picture worth? A dollar. The photographers in this room would disagree. <laughs> A lifetime? That's right. There's, a, there's all kinds of things that a, a picture can be worth. Um, and it, in this case, we want to look at what you can learn from a picture um, and, and what kind of information we can get out of it. So Colorbox Project is something at the intersection of emotions, colors, and insights. And what you see here is somebody from last night. That's Jesse Barney. And Jesse said something really interesting after participating in Colorbox. Um, he, he, he said to me, is, is like a moment in Wayne's world, he's like, that's me, man. And I'm like, yes, that is. <laughs> that is you. And he's like, no, that's, that's me. That's, that's me. That's who I am. This is, this is telling this story about me and my emotional self. And we think that's one of the really amazing things about what we're doing. And so when you realize that it's helping people express their inner selves, you can see how we start to talk about emotions and about what they mean. And so uh, we all kind of look at it as being like a team of real life superheroes with different kinds of superpowers. And uh, Royce is going to talk a little bit about how those superpowers form together. There's like a Captain Planet thing by, by our powers combined. Uh, and, and so I want to talk for just a second about uh, my superpower and uh, the role it plays in, in the design of this. And so. What we try to do is make the invisible relationships between color and emotion visible. That comes out in a variety of ways. It comes out in the portraits. It comes out in the data. And, and it's, uh, it's a recurring theme for me. Um, making relationships visible is something I spent five years doing um, in, a, in a startup where we were doing social network analysis and visualization. And so we drew these big maps of human networks and we could learn an incredible amount about people. Uh, we, we could learn who they trusted. We could learn to influence them. And that was simply uh, unattainable in a spreadsheet. No matter how you um, saw it in a spreadsheet, those relationships, when made visual, were something that we could understand. We we're taking this abstract intellectual thing and making it a sensory thing. And I think, uh, I think for, for me, this notion of understanding human relationships and human self-identity comes out of the way I was raised. Um, I, I was raised by a Presbyterian minister who brought some of the wealthiest kids in the world from uh, the Presbyterian Power Church in Naples, Florida, to homeless shelters. And so I've spent months of my life living in homeless shelters doing volunteer work. And, and uh, the difference between making homeless people visible versus invisible um, means that that generation of the aristocracy in Naples uh, is active and involved in homeless shelters and all this stuff. And I saw that just by creating relationships um, intentionally between them, that there are all these magic things that started to happen. And, and, and so uh, my parents, I think, would have much preferred that I be a minister or a politician, um, somebody out there making these relationships. But for me, it's more about building tools that uh, help other people see things that they need to see. Because the impact of seeing things that you need to see is profound. And, and so uh, what we want to do is talk a little bit about the details of this project and how we think it relates to Hatch and the kind of challenges and problems that uh, so many of the speakers have talked about. And to talk a little bit about the, this kind of live art experience that we create, I'm going to turn it over to Dick um, and let him talk. Great. And let's see where we are on the slides. Oh, yeah, here's our and, whole team. Yeah, and this is the team. And so I wasn't going to talk about this, but I'm Richard Whitney, or Dick is my uh, more common title, and Sean and Royce, and uh, our missing member, Elisa, who I believe you'll speak about later. Yeah, definitely. So, so uh, this is one of my favorite photos to come out of uh, one of these installations. I, uh, I love it when technology really enables creativity. So, uh, so you can't really see them, but off to the left, there's a punching dummy. So this is you know, a, a humanoid rubber man, and when you hit him or impact him in some way, 
it takes a photo. It's all automatic. Uh, and so this photo was taken sometime middle of the night out in the desert at Burning Man. I set, I set it up, I left it, I didn't look at it, I wandered off, and so I didn't get to see this particular moment happen. But this is the most impressive thing I've seen. So that dummy off to the left is standing at my height. He has his feet at, you know, five foot six maybe. Um, and you, from the dust on his hands, you can see he's tried it a bunch of times. But it's just <laughs> these, well, and, and actually I, I have a couple other photos of him trying other ridiculous stuff that didn't get pulled off quite as beautifully. Um, but yeah, just allowing people to have that opportunity to, uh, to improvise and to play with the tech and to, uh, and to put it out there uh, you know, w without clear instructions. This is a dummy that was made for, uh, for gyms, for teaching martial arts. Uh, and no other instructions, there's no words, there's just him. One person hits it, and then you just sort of get this, like, uh, this propagation of the information through the crowd. People tell each other what makes the, the, uh, the flash happen. Uh, and so you get beautiful photos like this. There's actually a progression of uh, sort of punch, then slap, then hug or kiss, and then kick, and then blunt object, and then like more extreme stuff. And it happens over and over again with these crowds. Um, and then things like this happen. People figure out where the camera is, and they think about what they can do with it. And so this is no guidance, no other inspiration. Uh, this is actually triggered by, uh, by jumping. So at the very bottom, there's a, a trigger platform. And these guys, who are, who are also just amazing uh, dancers, started coming up with a really cool stuff to do with it. The, the flick is my favorite because they really played with the depth, but there's also a, a great sort of Street Fighter II Hadouken uh, with the other guy flying off the screen. Uh, so yeah, ways in which we can create technologies that are open for people to, to improvise and to create and not limiting. And with that, I will pass it on to Royce. Okay, cool. Um, so, I just want to talk a little bit about my experience with this project, Colorbox, and some lessons that I learned. And there's two key lessons that I took away from this. And a little backstory is I'm a professional filmmaker. And to do such, you have to have resources and crew, and it takes months to put things together or sell them or package them. And it, it really is time intensive, and it also is a perfectionist art. You know, we are looking to make the perfect uh, story told through visuals and sound. And Sean came to me to do this project because he knew I had photography skills and I was like in the middle of a project, a film project, and I was like, yeah, sure, I'll come and help. And I show up at this event and we have these colors and we have all these people, creative individuals, and they came together and it was this incredible moment for me where I basically learned that Sometimes, to break through creatively, you just have to make something. You just have to go and do it and try to make it fun and surround yourself with like-minded people. And what we found from, you know, if you tell the concept really quick, it's like, yeah, people are going to use colors and they're going to emote the colors and it's like, okay, I don't really get it. But when you see these images and the creativity that people bring just naturally to it, <laughs> it's just like, whoa, you know totally blew my mind, and, and I was really uh, excited to be a part of it. Um, and it also gave me sort of a, a new little piece of the puzzle of, that I had never tried before, which was like prototyping. And in film, we just don't really do that. And I'm looking forward to an opportunity when I can, to, because it can grow. You know, if you just do something creative, it can grow into something beautiful. And uh, that kind of leads into the, the next part about creative leadership. This was the second lesson that I learned from this project, um, that Sean basically had this idea. It was a seed, and he planted it in four different little areas in the soil. And I was one of those, Dick was one of those, Elisa and Sean. And what he did was brought people's um, basically superpower together. And then he let those people do what they did best. And a little example of this is, we've done this a few times, and even last night, we set up a psych, which is basically like a big uniform wall to capture photography on with a background. And it takes a lot of time, you have to iron the thing out, it took like most of the prep time for this. And 
Both times we've done that, I came in, and when I finally looked through the camera, I was like, we got to lose the psych. And with basically no hesitation, these guys just looked at me and they said, let's do it. And it created these opportunities of big movement and expression. And I think that the, the lesson I'm getting at here is that they allowed um, the, the creative person to be themselves and do their thing. And, and that was the, the creative leadership lesson that I learned from Sean on this project. So um, the, the other part of it was the cross-pollinization, and that relates to Hatch in the way that we met through Hatch. And, um, and, and you can see the, the sort of like literally physicality of that cross-pollinization process happen in these photos. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really. Uh, and I'm going to speak for a second for our missing colleague here who re regrets that she can't be here. But Elisa Fennenbach is um, an instructor um, and facilitator at Stanford's design school and a toy inventor at IDEO. And she wrote this blurb, and it, it's a little bit long, but I'm going to read it. And it says, that the purest form of self-expression is through body, gesture, and movement. That kind of raw, emotional, and creative expression is healing. In Western society, this kind of sensual and physical expression is, at best, not encouraged. At worst, it's rigorously suppressed through social norms. I use the color, texture, and sensuality of the fabrics to engage people with that fifth sense, that of touch and feeling, incorporating hidden folds, pockets, and grips to encourage play and exploration in the fabric pieces and color box. Not taking myself too seriously, the pieces are meant to allow the user to hide and snuggle with the pieces and ultimately just have fun with the new experience. And if you look at some of our fabric art, she's done a tremendous job. And, and uh, this is a standard uh, we want to hit in each installation we do is to be using fabric art, um, which, is, which is pretty cool. And the outcome has been extraordinary so far. Um, this is one of maybe uh, 50 people, I would say, who've uh, used a color box photo for their Facebook portrait. Uh, you gotta wonder why that is. Why is, it that, why is it that they get the picture and it becomes a Facebook portrait? Um, and I think it's the intersection of all these things that we work really hard to do, but I think it's also because we're helping them uh, show who they are. And we're helping them tell a story about their emotional self in a way that they can't do with words and that they don't really do with the like snap an iPhone picture in the mirror kind of thing and all that. Uh, and speaking of being on Facebook, um, a week from yesterday, we, on, on next Friday, we're going to work with Hatch to release uh, all of the photos from the color box installation. Hopefully that'll be like a little Hatch recharge. As you're, you're getting low on Hatch energy, we'll, we'll put those out. Uh, a, a few quick points. Uh, we kind of think of this in some ways as a musical instrument. I grew up uh, playing, playing piano, and I can still sit down at a piano and say something that I could never say with words. I, I just, there are things that exist in my mind that can't be put out in words or anything else. And, and I think Colorbox allows the same. Allows you to do what Jesse did and show yourself. Um, we also are thinking of it as a focus group. And so uh, we're, we worked with Stanford. Later this month, we're working with Coke. Uh, we're working, talking to a couple of other big brands about how we can help them better understand uh, their consumers or their executives or the future of their company. Uh, and we're also really interested in this idea of story data. Um, Elkie's probably registering storydata.com right now, would be my guess. Uh, we're really interested in this idea. And so, to come back to Hatch, um, <laughs> we, um, we'll start with friction. Right, Will? Uh, we didn't coordinate. I didn't know his talk was going to be about friction. But uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm just going to let the picture speak for itself, actually. Uh, so, so here's friction um, from last night. Uh, here's breaking through. And I should say, I mean, most of the people here participated in this, but for those who didn't, uh, the way it works is you choose a prompt and you choose a, a, a piece of fabric and you get some direction. You know, Royce, uh, Royce helps you look good. Uh, by choose the prompt, you choose a keyword, like uh, breaking through was a concept we were expressing. So you choose from a list and you choose the colors yourselves. We don't tell you what color or what words or anything, um, but we'll help you 
frame the shot properly and stuff like that. Uh, here's one I really like. Uh, and again, like Royce pointed out, people, uh, people start doing crazy stuff. Dick was talking about it. You give people this opportunity to be creative, and they will. So like, when we talk about the creativity crisis and this kind of thing at Hatch, um, I think we envision this in some ways as like a battle campaign against that enemy, <laughs> you know? Uh, and it's one tiny little piece of it, but these experiences so far help lots and lots of people be very creative. And so uh, uh, these, these two wanted to break all the rules and have us turn the camera and that kind of stuff, and it was, so we obliged. Um, here's disruption. And this one's a little more subtle. I kind of like that about it. You gotta, you gotta really, yeah, you, you gotta really think about what's going on there, but he's, 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 he's trying to meditate in the face of this thing overcoming him. Uh, which is probably an appropriate response to disruption. Um, here's an epiphany. And uh, when we analyzed this, I <laughs> very uh, quickly this morning did some, some data analysis of the images. We can start to see how people chose colors. So we actually had two color palettes, so there's a lot of colors. But you can see some things that stand out, like um, epiphany. Um, people used the all steel color ice and the all steel color poolside and the color box color yellow, m you know, in significant ways in Epiphany more than others. And in Zen we see um, sun kissed and ice and leek. And, and so by no means do we claim that this is um, something from which you can draw correlations about designing products immediately. We like to think of it as a piece of inspirational data that maybe helps you understand something differently than you did, did before. Uh, and so we'll continue to analyze this data. We, we didn't have time to do a full breakdown uh, in this case, but one of my favorite points of data that we're starting to analyze in the shoots we do is whether or not people are smiling uh, and, and how they respond to that. There was, uh, there were, I think it was like 8 or 9% of the people in, in grieve that, who were responding to the word grieve were smiling, which was curious. Uh, and some of that might just be social experience. but. Uh, and only 25% of people trying to embody cuddle were smiling, which seemed weird to me. Cuddling, silly, smiley. But uh, here's our, the other track we took was Express Your Creative Superpower. <laughs> I, I actually I love this shot. And, and so uh, in this case, it's uh, not just one word you're responding to, but it's something inside yourself that you're telling us about, uh, w which I think is fundamental to understanding who a person aspires to be. Um, and, and certainly in the context of Hatch, I think something that uh, Royce and I can say, and Dick, now that he's a Hatch alum, can probably say is that uh, Hatch for us has become a platform where we can take meaningful steps towards being the people and the artists and the scientists that we want to be. And so I think that's an extraordinary thing is that this network of people helps people be the person they want to be. And, of course, there's some data about this. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, red, red was the primary color that people, or the, the prominent, most prominent color people selected when they were expressing a superpower. And, of course, it'd be interesting to compare this, you know, so if we take this hatch group and put it next to a school, what different colors do they choose? Or do they smile or not? Um, Here's another little quick point of data analysis I thought was interesting from Hatch is gender. Uh, the one point that really stands out is epiphany. Um, women chose epiphany much more than men or mixed groups. Uh, maybe that's because women are having more epiphanies. Uh, uh, and no women chose disruption. Uh, and so to kind of wrap up here, um, our commitment, given that this has some, is something that's come out of relationships intentionally structured by Hatch and by Yarrow and by some other wonderful people, is to think of this as a labs project for Hatch. Um, and, and that includes sharing a portion of our revenue. Uh, there's a brilliant woman named Linda Stewart who couldn't be here this year, but a few years ago she said to me and an, a group of people, uh, you know, if you have projects and revenue coming out of the relationships you form at Hatch, uh, you should be giving back. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, Linda. <laughs> and uh, 
And, and yet, yeah, please keep that in mind. Um, I would wager that there are some projects that are going to come out of the last few days. And uh, give back. You know, uh, in commercial business, we all have to pay a marketing budget, and it's usually pretty substantial. You know, we have to spend money to generate opportunities, and Hatch isn't like that, but it does have to grow, and it, it has to be able to survive and thrive, and giving back to the, this community is one way to do it. And so the question we would leave you with is, um, it, I guess the challenge maybe is, uh, Royce and I and Elisa and Dick have put this community to use, and we've said that we are able to do extraordinary things, you know, and we've talked a lot about concerns for the creativity crisis and the kind of problems we face. Um, but we also need to talk about what we do and, you know, put the community to use. Um, there's, there, there's an extraordinary opportunity here to make the world we want to live in and to help every person be the person they aspire to be. Questions for these boys? <laughs> Thanks. All right, guys. All right. Well, th thank you. And uh, you'll let us all There's know. Oh, never mind. Comment. Sorry. Not Russian. I just want to say that I find it really interesting to see the data that's coming out. Um, I didn't expect that from the project and knowing that you guys are involved in digital visualization, of course I should have expected something like that. Um, but I think that is a really unique quality um, and, and something very valuable uh, that, that does speak about demographics and about um, behaviors that uh, companies would find valuable. And, and the, the idea of taking something that is super creative, empowering people within corporations and then allowing them to see the value of that is really, really cool and important. So thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it's not, I, I don't know if maybe you mentioned this, but what was the specific moment, Sean, where this brainchild, what was the spark that you went, oh, maybe I, this could maybe be cool? Well, I was, I was looking at Jesse Barney's Facebook page and the pictures were just, uh, uh, it, it started with a frustration, like a lot of things. I do a lot of data visualization work and it's always pixels, 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 pixels. My whole life is pixels. And I really um, was inspired by the work of people like Bob Moog and these guys who design these analog self-expression tools. And, and so I started thinking about how to do data visualization um, and actually, you know, there's a, some of you might know Edward Tufte. I meant to put this in the presentation, but has anybody seen uh, Edward Tufte's t-shirts? If you are into the world of design and visualization, you might know this. Um, and I was thinking about this, and so it came from, in, in part, Tufte's t-shirts of like, do we put colored t-shirts on people? And, it, and then I think, honestly, I learned an extraordinary lesson in, in trying to bring this to life which uh, was to design around existing skill sets, which seems so obvious, and yet is so hard to do. Uh, and so I had this idea of kind of Tufty's t-shirts and of self-expression and musical instrument kind of thing. And, and then it became a matter of designing, um, we, we recruited Dick a, a, a little bit later, but uh, it became a matter of designing around the skills of two people I really wanted to work with. Um, who were Royce and Elisa. And so I said, I have this kind of thing I want to do in some way, and it was very, very rough-hewn single page in a design journal. And then um, talked to Royce and Elisa and said, I'd love for you guys to be a part of this. What do we actually make it? And, and so we defined it together. And, uh, you know, like I dis disagreed <laughs> with Royce more than once on this project, but the decision making is easy because Royce is so damn good at what he does that I defer to his judgment on the photography and on the software, I defer to Dick's judgment. And, it, you know, and, and so everything just seems to, you know, it's like uh, somehow we seem to be getting a lot luckier based on the fact that everyone's extraordinarily good at what they do and has been doing it for a long time. 
Um, so as, that's how it came about. So I think it's pretty amazing that, you know, you're taking um, a, these very artistic expressions and analyzing them, uh, analyzing the data to come up with conclusions. And as a designer, I got a lot of theory about color as well. You know, I mean, it can change um, everything. It can change moods. I believe it can even affect our health. And as we're seeing here, you know, people relate certain emotions to certain colors, you know what I mean? This room itself is white, <laughs> but it's not. Yeah. So in all of your, um, I guess, seeing the data that you guys have collected, can you talk a little bit about your theory on color? Well, Royce. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, it's a work in progress. I think that the more um, of these that we do, uh, the more data we'll have and, and the more kind of actualized theory we'll be able to create. And yeah. your gut feels though on... What's that? Gut feels about color. Oh, gut feelings? Um, you know, it's, you, I think <laughs> Dick and I are both <laughs> nerds at the end of the day. I stay up late reading about Linux. Um, and, and, uh, and so I think we're both kind of like, oh, but the data's not good enough. <laughs> um, all right, I, I, yeah, a couple gut feelings. I think that um, I think that our cultural connotation of color is not right, um, and that's something that resonates deeply with me. Um, the pink and blue thing, you know, boys are blue and girls are pink, has never made any freaking sense to me. Um, in my mind, girls are yellow, uh, <laughs> and boys are brown, and. And, and, and so I've always had this sneaking suspicion that our cultural connotation might be a little bit off and that we all just sort of submit to this cultural standard. Uh, and so I don't know that I can list a specific example, but what we see in the data is usually surprising. Like I said the other day with tickle being green, um, glow being yellow. Uh, 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 grieve being blue. Well, and, and so few guys doing epiphany, which seems odd. I mean, you, you're talking about a, a group of people who are all very creative, and guys didn't trend towards this word that is so central to the creative process. Um, yeah, just really surprising. Yeah, and I mean, that's the essence of data visualization, um, is the insights that come out of it um, often defy your assumptions. And so I think uh, I, if, it, if there's one, like, Primary takeaway, I'd say we all as designers need to have a lot of humility about what we assume to be the correlation between emotion and color because we're probably wrong. I'm son, yeah. Um, uh, let me see. I don't know if this is a question, but it might be an opportunity, and I'd love to get your instinct on it. Um, if you just look at the retail space, I'm sorry, if I couldn't you, hear you. If you just look at the retail space, retail spaces. Have we looked at no, retail spaces? If you do, if you look at retail spaces, uh, they're yeah. really they're changing fundamentally, right? From yeah. points of purchase to points of experience. Yeah. And, um, and I think that you know, the opportunity for, the, for what you're sort of tapping into here and sort of making that into a spatial experiment um, and looking at how color can, can uh, take someone on a journey through a space um, obviously, you know, we understand it in terms of architecture, but in terms of retail, yeah. which is a very emotional uh, journey anyway, right? Um, I mean, Apple stores are, are really good examples to start and actually don't have much color in. But um, I, it'd be really interesting, I don't know, I just get your reaction, but maybe for you guys to look at in terms of really uh, taking what you're doing and sort of splashing it onto the world, so to speak. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a really keen observation. It, you, uh, you said journey, and I thought of, and someone please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Mask of the Red Death, uh, the a story in which there's this party that progresses through all these rooms in a spectrum of color, and each one's sort of thematically different, and they flow into each other, and the, uh, the sort of, the feeling you get is that the emotional charge of the rooms is totally different because of their color. Um, and yeah, I was thinking about um, almost avant-garde retail. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think, uh, one thing that immediately comes to mind when you say that is thinking of how uh, how brands and and retailers and and uh, those kind of uh, commercial organizations can uh, let us help them research their consumers 
And when you talk about having an experience, you know, um, I would love to see something like this um, as it relates to a, a big fashion designer. You know, we, and that's something that Elisa is um, already uh, wanting to do um, is there's a few designers out there and we'd really like them to help us create fabric uh, and, and see if we can uh, help play a role in that because we would love to um, someday, you know, see in a retailer uh, some clothing where the design was impacted by this research. Um, so there's some stuff there. And, and I think as a side note, this plays into kind of the first lesson I talked about where just like it's evolving, obviously, what we're doing here, but, but just the fact that we started with something and, and made something and it, it's evolved, it's evolved every time and it's gonna continue and I think that that's really exciting and a big takeaway for, for everyone is, is like just go and make something. Yeah, well, we, we, yeah. yeah we certainly Absolutely. we see more possibilities every time and better yet the people who are participating see possibilities that we didn't think of yeah so, um, Stacy from Intel was talking about the Intel science fair and she's like how would you feel about shooting 1500 leading high school scientists and I'm like salivating <laughs> 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 yes please um, and, and there are a couple other projects um, we're trying to work with the Cherokee Nation uh, to tell American Indian myths, so having the teenagers of that community act out the uh, sort of old sacred stories. And I, I guess maybe this is a good closing note is to say, uh, it, for every idea you have, uh, please share them with us. Come find us, we're, we're very collaborative. Uh, we're looking to get to the point where we develop a model where every brand shoot we do also funds a shoot with like a KIPP Academy or some sort of uh, nonprofit organization. And we've talked about doing that with uh, wounded warriors coming home from the war. And I, keep, I hope Alex and I are gonna work together on something like that. And, uh, and, and we, you know, we, we really, uh, we're excited about the future. And, and I can't stress enough that um, <laughs> there's just not a chance in hell that this would have happened without Hatch. So uh, <laughs> all credit. <laughs> to that, uh, that platform that creates these kind of opportunities. Well, we're going to take one more question oh, here okay, okay. for our last <laughs> or presenter not, of the day. So real quick. Sure. Sorry, I just wanted to be the one to ask a commercial question because I yeah. think what you're trying to do is great in the fact that you're giving back to Hatch. So for those of us who have got contacts into the corporate world or the events world where we know that these corporations spend a lot of money on things that are lame, how, where, where, how can we sell this? Where do, they, where do we say, hey, you've got to get these guys in to be there at the end of your, of your corporate days? Like, is there a website? How do we do this? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. That's a, that's a, great, uh, that's a great question. Uh, the website is colorboxproject.com. Um, and right now, as, a, as an unfunded project, it's a pretty simple blog that just has our has our photos and that kind of thing up. And uh, we have an email address of talk at Colorbox Project. Um, you can also just talk to me. But, um, uh, you know, I, I think uh, one, of the, one of the really interesting things about this is once we just, in our experience so far, is once we set up the call, uh, the brands that we've talked to have uh, very quickly started generating ideas of how they're going to use it. So with, with Coke, um, or the a leading beverage company, um, <laughs> they, uh, we, we uh, at a high level, I can say we're, we're going to work with people um, who are thinking about the future of the brand. And, and they're thinking about uh, perception of the brand. And so when we talk about being a focus group, um, that's about how accurate we are. You know, um, a real data scientist, um, which I suppose technically both of us are, but, uh, uh, you know, we could rip into this as, as being inaccurate in a bunch of ways, not to mention that we truly encourage people to drink a lot. Um, well, <laughs> no, but well, that's for honesty. That's for honesty, right? I, you know, I, I'm going to tell one quick side story. We were at this kind of raucous event down in L.A., and one of the words we chose was fuck. And we had this theory that the event, which went from noon to midnight, um, that nobody would do fuck until the booze came out. And it's true. <laughs> and then once the booze came out, the number <laughs> dramatically jumped. But um, to simplify my response to your question, I think uh, for brands, we're positioning ourselves as uh, something of a focus group. 
that can be used for consumers or executives. And executives are actually, like, getting feedback from your executive committee in this fashion is something that I think is very exciting to a lot of brands. Great. Well, thank you, guys. Mm -hmm.